Breaking news! I repeat, breaking news! Today we present the Slate Digital ML2 Virtual Instrument Microphone. Okay, ladies and gents, now after the dramatic intro, uh, this is a project that I recorded yesterday. This is really kind of thrown together with a musical idea that I had. And just have a quick listen to this. Now, those among you with the more keen ears will go, oh, that sounds like it's not been mixed. And that's absolutely true. That is just the slate microphones on guitar cabs, on acoustic guitar, on bass guitar. And no mixing at all. So, I mean, listen to this acoustic guitar. Apart from the fact that my playing is rather rushed, so it's not the best. Have a listen to this. So yeah, apart from the fact that I'm missing the picking, to me, I don't know about you, but that sounds beautiful. That That's a cheap Fender acoustic, fresh strings of course, and it's got one Slate ML2 microphone, or what I would call the vanilla position, which is 12 inches away from the 12th fret, and I've double tracked it, one for the left, one for the right, and that's it. So let's open Virtual Mix Rack. Turns out I didn't quite record it hot enough for the uh, recommended, so I boosted it with a trimmer by 6 dB, which of course imparts no tonal flavour at all. And then it's going into the virtual mics. In fact, if I turn off the virtual mics for a second, this is what the ML2 sounds like with no processing at all. <laughs> So it sounds fairly neutral, fairly flat, um, fairly usable. I mean, in a lot of recordings, I'd probably be quite happy to use that. I mean, the fact that I can do better with this software is, is a big bonus, but that's a good start. So let's turn this on. And I'm using the FG76 tube preamp here with some uh, virtual drive on it. I'm going to leave that as is, and I'm going to leave that on. And let's flick through some of the microphones. So the one that I settled on was the S222, which is a version of a Sherps mic, a tube, small diaphragm condenser, which is really quite a rare thing. But the reason I settled on that is in the mix after the heavy guitars, I was finding that this one sat well. But this isn't the one that I chose when I was tracking. When I was tracking, I chose the S414, which is an AKG C414. So let's have a listen to that. So what I just did there is I hit solo on the trimmer and all that's doing is it's turning off the microphone and the tube pre-emulation in one go. And you could hear when I turned that on, everything sounded a lot thinner. So when I turned the, the mics back on, suddenly it's much fuller, like a 414. And that sounds great to me. I mean, what if you don't want all that high end? What if you want it to be natural? You might use the 121, which is the uh, Royal 121 ribbon. It's not going to magically turn it into a figure eight pattern, but what it does do is a cardioid version of it is it sounds much kind of warmer and rounder. So let's listen to that.
So that's interesting to me that 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 string zing that you hear without the emulation is very much tamed down as it would be on a ribbon. It would be much more quote unquote natural. Uh, let's change that again. The uh, let's go the other way. If you want that zing, the four five one. Listen to this. This is what I would call a pop acoustic. Listen to this. <laughs> See, that's got all that rich, sizzly high end. If that's what you want, it's right there. I I was planning on going with a sound like that, and then I actually found that in the mix, at what well, I say mix before I'd even begun mixing, I was playing the heavy part of the song before that and playing them back to back, and it was too bright. It was comparatively too much, so that's why I settled on that two two two. But um, let's let's just look. Look quickly, what if we wanted to use Neumann U67's several thousand pound valve tube uh, large diaphragm condenser model? Very mid forward, very uh almost folksy I would say I mean it doesn't work for me in this particular context but if I was doing something that was more of an acoustic album or like you know, some sort of folkish track that is exactly the kind of sound I pick or how about a U47 FET which is like a solid state version of a U47 That's definitely a larger than life sound. Let's try that with the rest of the track. Sounds great, but the one that I decided my ear likes on this song is that 222. That 222 has that kind of valvey mid forwardness but it also has a little bit more of that top end zing that i was liking without being crazy super zingy like the 451 was which like i was saying if that's what you want great <clears throat> now that's the acoustic i thought that was a great example to start with uh let's look at the heavy guitars so this is the rhythm guitars, so this. And that's got no EQ on it. That's just straight off those slate mics off the board. That's it. That's incredible to me. There's no EQ work had to go in. That's using a two notes le lead preamp into a Mesa Boogie 5050 uh, 6L6 power amp into my Zilla 4x12 cab. And if you look at this picture, this this craziness of a mic setup is it's an SM57 on the kind of the outside of the cap. It's one of these slate ML2s in exactly the same position, but on the other side of the speaker, just so that I can have two mics on the same speaker, giving me comparative, yeah, something I can flip between, which we're going to hear, and another one right in the middle, which for some mic configurations, I would have a mic right on the, the middle, and I'll show you what I would do with that. So I'm going to take one of these guitars, mono it, and then just listen to this in solo. So let's... Listen, this is, this is one of these guitars. This is a real SM57. Very bitey. Now in the same position, but on the other side of the speaker, this is the vintage SM57 model from the Slate. 
with the Hollywood tube preamp. It's interesting that the low end's chugging away where it isn't on the 57. I thought that was really, really interesting. They're both using identical preamps. I decided for this video to use the Audient ASP 800 because that's a preamp bank that I've got that has eight channels, six of which are identical. So I figured I would use those six. I ended up using four for this video, for this demo, uh, which we'll talk about. But uh, that way, at the very least, they're all clean, they're all neutral, they don't add a sound. And most importantly, they're all the same, which means that I can use the real mics and the slate mics back to back. And then we can't then blame better or worse sound on the preamp because if i tried them back to back they would be within like something like 0.1 percent of being identical at least that's the design anyway so this is yeah same mic position and i used torches and and everything to make sure that this was absolutely the same i really tried to make sure that the positioning of the mics wasn't affecting it and it really does sound like this is a kind of darker mic. So let's switch this vintage out for the modern one, which is probably much more like the 57 I was using, which is one of the modern made in Mexico ones. So let's switch vintage. I'm going to play it with vintage and switch to modern halfway through. <laughs> Interesting how that one's more mid forward. So let's comp compare that to the SM57. And that really quite surprised me there that the uh, the modeled SM57s they've gone for aren't as bright as the one that I was using. Which is okay, that's fine. Um now here's where it gets interesting. I brought the brightness back by using a 421 model. I I have a real vintage 421, which you'll see in the next part, but I didn't want to try and crowd the speaker. So what I quite often do is if I'm going for a bright rock and roll tone, I'll have a 421 right in the middle of the speaker and then blend that in because the 421 has a characteristic where it's, it's quite bright anyway it's got a bit of a mid scoop it's got a little bit it's got a bit of a, a low mid warmth and a kind of it brings a chug so that on its own should sound quite kind of horrible but when i add that together with the 57 model which i'll put back to the vintage oops careful now there we go so if I bring that up and so we've got these two together. And that's interesting that I can see the meters going there and the 57 is the one that's doing the jug, 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 jug low end and the 421 isn't. But that means we don't get a doubled up low end on those chugs so we don't get an overbearing i mean yes this is a bright sound uh but this is a typical like late 80s early 90s rock sound it's one of the classic combos a, a vintage 57 which wasn't vintage at the time and a classic 40, 421 which i believe would have been before the 421 mark ii was designed so these two mics right here <laughs> That is the classic rock tone. Now, one thing that I can do, let's switch out that 421. Now, instead of the, the condenser mics, the microphones on this were switched into dynamic mode uh, because I expected the cab to be loud. So I kind of expected the ML2s to distort. So in that case, you switch it to dynamic mode and then you use the dynamic microphone models and any of the mics down here that have dynamic in the name. So if we pick the one to one dynamic, uh, that's the Royal Ribbon, uh, but with the microphone set to match. So quite a lot of modern rock guys use this combination where they'll use a one to one ribbon, which has a lot less high end in it, and they'll blend that in with an SM57. 
but to compensate for the fact that the one two one's quite dark, you put that in the middle of the speaker, and that combination sounds like this. <laughs> So back to the 41, I'll switch between them and you'll see how much brighter and then not brighter it is. So what I'm quickly going to do is go back to having this as the stereo pair because this is usually our guitars are tracked. And I'm going to change the other 421 to the dynamic as well. Listen to this. Now that sounds great. Uh, I found in context though, it wasn't jumping out at me. See how now, it, as much as it sounded great on its own, it's kind of lost, but that's because this is a relatively fast track. There's a lead guitar going on. I don't want to have to do any heavy EQ work, which is why that's why I decided to have that 41 because I'll uh, I'll flick these over and you'll see very quickly how that will change to be what? So suddenly that top end on those rhythm guitars is sitting in a place in the mix. And there will be some EQ work needed when I come to mix this, but the less, the better. That, that's very much what I'm aiming for here, is picking the right mic choices, which I tried to pick the right mic choices as I was going, as I was tracking, but being afforded the opportunity here to be able to do it afterwards is so good. Now, let's have a look at the bass, because this is an interesting one. I tracked the bass, I used a real 421 on the bass, on the bass cap. So this was a solid state 3 or 400 watt power amp going through a Marshall 8x10, but with a two notes la bass, so a tube preamp running the whole thing. And with a 421 on the bass cap with no EQ, it sounds like this. So, uh, when I had finished tracking this, I had a, a, a light compressor, a bit of an EQ, and a virtual mix bus on. But as you can see, these are all turned off right now. This is just to show you what the mics sound like. So, I did have to use two different speakers here because my usual mic configuration on a bass cab is to have a 421 right in the middle of the speaker to get that clarity and punch that otherwise won't cut through a mix. So, let's compare this to what I've called Slate Close. So I used the same mic. You can actually see in this shot that my uh, 421 is in the same colour. It's it's a 421U5, I think. It's one of the older ones. It got converted from the old German two-shell connector. It's, it's old. And <clears throat> I'm using a Neve preamp here, which is, yeah, not bad. And it's got a bit more low end than a real 421. And I did check the M and S switch on my uh, <clears throat> 421 was on M for music, so there was no filter on it. And. <clears throat> So <clears throat> they sound fairly similar to me, apart from the, the very low end is a bit richer on the slate one, which I'm not complaining about because as, as a bass instrument, that's very much what I would want anyway. And having the opportunity to cut that is fine. Something to briefly talk about at this point, you'll have seen trimmer on almost every track with a minus six dB. Uh, that's because I like to mix at analog 
levels <clears throat> the way that I see it. I like to have tracks coming out so that I can have all my faders around zero and not have the master bus anywhere near clipping. Uh, but the ML2 is recommended to have uh, peaks of about minus 12 to minus 10 dBFS hitting it to get the emulation of the microphone working as intended. So that's why I'm I'm hitting the mic emulation at the right level and it's too loud for what I want. So the trimmer is at the end after the emulation just to bring it all back down to a level that I would work with. And if you don't work that way, that's cool. That's just me. So I just wanted to mention that briefly. Now let's say instead of the 421 we wanted more of a classic kick, a classic bass mic. So let's switch a 421 out for I don't know. Uh, let's start with an SM57. That's really brought out that jing 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 noise on the bass, but that may not sit well in this mix. Let's try an RE20. And that's got a very even lower register. A uh, typical RE20, it's got a relatively neutral character, very even, very big, thick sound. Let's try the D112, the, the egg mic. Let's skip ahead to a 414. Now let's get clever, because you can use the FET 47. You can hear how certain notes in the bass and certain mic configurations are resonating at different points. That's that very often that's why I use a compressor on a bass channel. Not because my playing is is even or not even, but because between the resonances of the cabinet, the resonances of the mic, and the resonances of the room even, uh, you might find that certain notes come out louder than others. So that's something I personally expect at this level. So let's let's try the four five one. That's probably too bright for this. No. Now that's interesting because the speakers don't have anything in them really above maybe four or five kilohertz. So if the mic model's raising above that and there's nothing there to begin with, it doesn't do much. Let's try the D12. Ooh, hello. I might actually go with that. I'll, I'll go with that. And now there's another mic, which is the room mic, which you can see me focusing on here. Now the bass cab had a tweeter in it and I wanted to get some of that brightness so I put a mic six feet back. Uh, the camera has a quite a wide angle lens so the perspective is a little strange here but it is about six feet back and that 451 is really coming into play. If we switch that out for something like a 414. Gives us kind of a rounder sound there, which is cool. Uh, or a 67 even. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on this EQ here, which really brings the 3K out. Now if we bring that D12 close mic in as well, which has all that thunder in low end. Sounds great. Now let's go to the mix. Let's put a compressor on. Maybe not need to boost quite so much of that high end now with that mic choice. 
Let's see how that sounds. Now that sounds like an absolute monster and there's some very light compression and not a necessarily crazy EQ on it and that is probably us done. Oh, and one last bonus is let's turn on the slate tape. Let's see how that sounds in a mix. Now let's just quickly talk about the drums. They are a stand-in. They're slate drums for. They're, they're just covering right now. Uh, one thing I'm going to do in the next week or two is I'm going to uh, record real drums with the ML2s. Only having two of them, what I'm going to do is mic up the full kit with mics I would usually use and then replace them two by two by two. So I'll switch out the kick mics, switch out the snare mics, switch out the tom mics, and so on and so on, so that you can hear what I'm doing and what it can affect. Um, if I had 12 or 14 ML2s, I'd do a kit that had them all on and maybe at some point in the future, I'll have that many of them. Uh, but for now, this is what we have to roll with. Uh, the drums here are literally just to hold it down while we prove a point. Let's look at this lead guitar, because this, I switched in. So we had an SM57 and a 421 on the cab, the real ones. Sounds okay, but it wouldn't gel in a mix. I would have to add some sort of room reverb. So why not do it with real mics? So that's where the Slate ML2s come in here. So this is a stereo pair, which means you only have to put one, uh, one virtual mix rack instance in there and it works for both. Now this is the room mics and I use the 222 again because it's got a little bit of brightness and some mid forwardness and I'm really pushing the saturation on the New York preamp. Let's try that as a U67. Or a U47. Let's try it as a ribbon. That room mic now is really forming a large part of the sound here. So let's go with, let's try 414 again. I think I picked the two two twos in the end. Let's try the 451. Yeah, I picked this one because I just didn't want the room mics to be too far mid forward in this case. I, I didn't want to have to, again, if, if I don't have to EQ anything out because of the right mic choices, that's a double win because as soon as you start messing with microphone choices, you start tweaking the phase of things, it can get messy in a multi-mic setup. If you've chosen the right mics to begin with, it just kind of works and ha can have a much more natural result. And yeah, I wanted quite a roomy lead sound because I wanted that to jump out above the rhythm guitars, which don't have any room sound in them. Let's just make sure those SM57s are muted. If 
I turn that room mic off. You can still hear that lead, but it doesn't jump at you. It, it doesn't stand out. It just blends in and doesn't work. If I turn the volume up on it, it would probably be the same thing. But instead, if I just put that room in... And then right at the end, this all goes a bit crazy. The, instead of a, a lead, it's an actual solo part. I decided to add a top line on the guitars. Now, I didn't change the preamp, I, although I did turn the gain down and use a single coil on, well, a single coil tap on my Les Paul instead. Uh, I used the same power amp and I used the same cabinet. So what I usually do in a mix is I change things up to make a, a second layer of guitar fit in the mix. Uh, because the more layers you get, the more frequency buildup you get. If it's the same cabinet, same mic position, same everything, you start to run into problems where it sounds congested and it's difficult to EQ. Uh, whereas if everything's different, they naturally kind of slot into different frequency positions in a mix and you can end up with a full mix with less fighting. So I decided for this to experiment, keep them all the same, except change the microphones. So this is what I did for that outer microphone. I changed it from an SM57 to a U67 which is a bit mid-forward, but it's a bit more of what I would call an honest mic rather than the 57, which is a real character mic. I mean, yes, the 67's got bags of character as well, but it's a different character. And then the RE20 having a fairly neutral response I used on the inside. Blend the two together. And we ended up with a much more kind of mid, not not mid pokey, but just kind of neutral, honest, realistic ish. Again, this is all with no EQ. This is all just flat. If I mix that in with these heavy guitars. It will need a bit of EQ work when I get to mixing this. But I tell you what, I've heard worse mixes than that on albums. And that's with nothing done yet. That's just with the actual... That's what I would expect to hear in a in a big recording studio, like big name recording studio. When you get in, you put the tape on the machine, you put the faders up having not done a mix. That's what I would want to hear. Because that's, that's so close that a little bit of a, you know, a high pass here, a bit of a mid cut or a mid boost here, a bit of room reverb or delay or something on the right thing and that is done that's not gonna need that much work at all and that's to me that is what these ml2s are good for i mean do they work on vocals as well arguably yes i mean the pack the pack of virtual microphones is called classic instruments i mean the clues in the name uh but you can use the u47 and u67 on a vocal and in fact when we cut back to me in a minute you'll hear the uh u 47 FET on the voiceover and it sounds quite reasonable. It's not as good I would have said as the ML1 with its own uh, emulations but it's more than passable and does it work on drums we will have to cover that next week or the week late after that but yes it does. So in the meantime I hope you found this useful and back to me in the studio. I mean, do they work on vocals? You're hearing it right now. This is one of the ML2s that's doing the voiceover for this section. I, I think it sounds quite decent. Uh, I decided 
while I was doing the test to use the U47 FET model. I think it was just kind of the most pleasant sounding one. If you want to record what I would call high-end vocals, you're probably better off buying the Slate ML1 microphone, which is the kind of Rolls-Royce. That's the vocal mic, the large the large diaphragm condenser version. Problem there is that's that the price has come down on those to £750. It's roughly equivalent in dollars, $799. These are £150, or I think it's $199, somewhere around there. The, the price depends where you're going, but I worked out I could buy five of these for the price of one of those vocal mics, the, the large diaphragm condenser. So for the cost of two of those LDCs, I could almost mic up an entire kit with these. I mean, I say they're virtual mics, they are real microphones. It's just that you then add the character to them in software, and it's... It's a very clever thing. I mean, if that's what it sounds like without any kind of mixing at all, then it's going to sound so good when I manage to pull the mix together because there's so much less work to do than there is either with inadequate mics or if you chose the wrong mic at the wrong time or any of those little things where you can then go back with these and go, actually, I'm going to change something. So... I'll be really interested to do that, and that's going to be a week or two maybe to get that released. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you found this useful, and thanks for watching. I'm Adam Steele for Hot Pole Studios. Check out some of the other videos we've got on the channel because we've got absolutely tons coming up, and we've done things like full Reaper tutorials, uh, guitar speaker shootouts, uh, comedy videos in the Challenge Accepted series, trying to get a good sound out of a bad piece of gear. There's all sorts on the channel, so thanks for watching, and... Hopefully we'll see you guys in the next video. Take care. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this, feel free to check out our other videos, as you can find here, or check out our Facebook and Twitter, or our Patreon page, which helps us to make more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.